So I think we'll start so we keep to time. So thank you everyone for joining uh, joining our webinar. So this is webinar two of a three-part series. The webinar series is, is on motivation and ability uh, framework, which is also termed MOTOR. Uh, it, MOTOR is a decision support tool for strategic planning and implementation. And that is also the heading of our, of our webinar series. The first webinar was conducted earlier on October the 21st, and there are four talks from, from that webinar that are available on the website, on the uh, IHE, uh, IHE Delft website around motivation and ability, so around the motor framework. So there's four talks on there. They're not recorded talks yet. We will go on and actually record those talks so that they're available, but at least the PDFs are there for now. And um, the idea of this webinar series is to introduce MOTA to a wider audience and also to discuss collaboration and working together into the future around the topic of motivations and abilities and the integration of more social science applications within performance-based projects, so within these technical performance-based projects. And this series will be consist of four talks. The talks will be 15 minutes each, and there will be 15 minutes for questions after that. And so Yup Evers will, he will monitor the, the chat room. So you can write your questions in um, in the chat box or the message box. What is it called, Yup, sorry? Is that uh, call it a chat box, but uh, you can use <laughs> it to share messages, yeah. Yeah, where you can share messages. And then at the end of each talk, we will, ask those questions to the presenter. So, uh, yeah, I think um, that is it. And then there will be a third seminar. So our third seminar leading on from this will actually be on December the 16th. And there will be three talks given there around motor and extending motor. And also a discussion on the development and applications and the research and the follow-up from where we would actually like to take motor from here with a wider audience of collaborators. So we'll we'll move straight to the to topic one within this webinar series, and that's around the applications of motor. And the first talk will be given by Dr. Shibley, and that will be on what is termed motor applications. The title is Motor Applications, Participatory Water Management in Bangladesh. So Shibley is an environmental and disaster risk management specialist. He's got a keen interest on strategic planning, policy making and action research. He completed his PhD in engineering from Kyoto University, Kyoto University, with a specific focus on environmental and disaster disaster risk science. So thank you, Shibley, and we are very much looking forward to this talk. So I'll let you go. Um, you have 15 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes of, uh, of questions. Yes, am I audible now? Yes, yes you are, please. And uh, my slides are fine, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, John, for your uh, introduction. And uh, my talk will be uh, MOTA application uh, on participatory water management in Bangladesh. And this is part of our collaborative research and uh, among the EGIS, uh, IT DELP. PRI Bangladesh and uh, WSCC of Vietnam National University. 
So just to give you a, a little background, I want to start the participatory water management context in Bangladesh. And, uh, yeah, and you know, like we had a, a traditional water management system where landlord actually got, uh, coordinated or mobilized the local people to manage the, uh, for example, embankment, uh, especially the seasonal embankment, the constructed embankment that is seasonal. But in 1950, uh, that uh, then government uh, abolished that Jumindari or Indian feudal religion system in 1950. And with that evolution, actually, the, that uh, traditional participatory water management uh, practices collapsed. And uh, after that, the ownership and all the responsibility of managing the water resource management shifted to the state. And uh, there was a gradual development with the international uh, advocacy and, uh, and, and, uh, and development of the partner towards the participatory water management. And recently, in 2014, uh, government uh, uh, established a new rule uh, that they call participatory water management rule and that again transferred the ownership and responsibility from the estate to the local people and now you know Bangladesh, uh, uh, Bangladesh Delta plan 2100 is reforming the participatory water management uh, again so now question is is it implementable and uh, there are two, I think, a very general argument or a general, uh, very general statement behind the participatory water management uh, practice in Bangladesh, especially, is that uh, implementing actors are complaining, local people are very less interested to participate. And they obviously need capacity, willingness, and to meet some basic uh, physiological requirement to participate. And our research actually aims to support the implementation of Bangladesh Delta Plan by informing this societal implementability context. And we adopted MOTA for this. So what is MOTA? I will not go into detail. I, I, I hope you have already uh, that information from the last uh, webinar. But uh, from the uh, uh, paper of the uh, Professor Fee, we know that what is planned is not always implementable. And implementability depends on ability, motivation, and perceived opportunity and threat of implementing actor. And at the same way, what is implemented is not always adaptable. Adaptability uh, depends on the societies and it depends on ability and motivation of the community and their perceived opportunity and the threats. So based on this pre pre concept, actually, uh, they developed MOTA tool and applied that in Vietnam. And we will see that case study in the, in the following presentation, in the next presentation. But now our question is, is it, is that MOTA is adaptable or can this MOTA travel from Vietnam to Bangladesh or not? And, and do we need further extension of the MOTA or contextualization of the MOTA? And, and if I did allow that a little bit further, like why uh, extension of MOTA is needed? You, uh, you, I think you already know this uh, diagram that was uh, presented in the, in the thesis paper. And in that paper, we know that like we can calculate the MOTA score from the motivation and ability. And in the original MOTA framework, that uh, motivation was defined by opportunity and threat, and ability was defined by four components, financial, institutional, social, and technical. But the question now is how to quantify each component. And to answer that question, actually, we need uh, a further extension of MOTA. And under this current research, we are trying to extending this uh, 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 this MOTA from component level to indicator level. So I will not uh, go very detail uh, into my methodology and other things. So I want to show you just one uh, our our so far draft result. I think this is our MOTA extension. We uh, actually uh, developed a. Uh, indicator framework for for MOTA, but that that is uh, uh, specific to the context of societal adaptability of participatory water management in Bangladesh. And to explain this uh, MOTA framework or indicator framework, I want to start with the action. And the when we developed this framework, we we assumed the action, or we considered the action what it was mentioned in the participatory water management rules. And if you see that, like we, we have find that now participatory water management rules uh, requires that participation in everyday operation, participation in routine maintenance, and participation in conflict maintenance. But from the perspective of the local people, uh, the participation means a uh, little bit uh, more further beyond the participatory water management rule. They want to involve in decision-making process, process, 
they also want to involve or they want to give voluntary labor and uh, and uh, they also want to work conflict management so based on this action uh, we try to develop how uh, the indicator framework like how can, uh, what should be the ability and motivation to perform this action and uh, I, then i will go to uh, trigger before explaining the ability and motivation so trigger the trigger behind these actions should be our, our announcement of participatory water management plan. When the government announced a new, a new participatory water management plan, it actually triggered the local people to think all about this. And the trend of rising water management problem, as I mentioned in the, in the background paper, like in 1950, when government uh, abolished the Jamindari system, the participatory water management system just collapsed. Then there was a gradual development and we still the development is happening at the same time our water management problems are increasing and it's becoming more complex so that situation that trend of rising water management problem actually uh, triggering people to think alternative to get involved in the uh, in the parts in the in the water management process and operation and of course the recent natural disasters are also triggering and with that trigger now we will move to the ability and motivation the indicators for ability and uh, we, we took the original components from the original uh, motor framework that faced uh, financial ability, technical ability, institutional ability, and societal ability. So we tried to identify like how to uh, how to quantify these uh, these uh, these components of ability. For example, I will not go into detail, but uh, for example, in case of technical ability. We took knowledge and availability of the information on, on the new plan uh, can be too important indicator to, to measure the, the technical ability of the community. And in case of institutional, we think supportive institution, political commitment, and ownership of the water resources are important indicator for uh, to measure the uh, institutional ability. So uh, this way, like we have, uh, we try to uh, identify the indicators, uh, uh, what will be helpful for us to quantify the ability. And at the same time, we try to identify the opportunities and threats, which will uh, help us to quantify the motivation. And we also try to develop an indicator map to see which indicator is influencing what, how they're influencing the ability uh, or how they're influencing the opportunity and threat. So this is a little bit of complex. I don't want to go into detail due to the, uh, uh, due to the time limitation, but uh, this this uh, this kind of exercise actually helped us to to develop our indicator further, to screen our indicator, or to make a list of indicator very concise and, and specific to the to the component. And then the question is, how can we apply this at field, right? So our target is to see or to explore the implementable implementation ability or uh, societal adaptability of participatory water management at coast, in a coastal polder. And uh, we, our plan is to conduct survey at polder level. And uh, our, uh, we are thinking the several method would be the focus group discussion at, at community level. And for that, like uh, for example, uh, if, if you remember, like uh, knowledge is an indicator of technical ability and uh, how to measure the knowledge. To measure the knowledge, we actually uh, translated knowledge into uh, three questions. So first question is, uh, the first question that we ask to the, we'll ask to the local people, like how do you rate your degree of knowledge to operate uh, water management infrastructure, for example, regulating the gate or uh, regulator gate or sluice. The second question we will ask uh, related to this is how do you rate the degree of knowledge to construct and maintain small water management infrastructure? And the third one would be the how do you rate the degree of knowledge to do regular maintenance of water management infrastructure? So again, like these questions were framed based on the actions uh, we we uh, uh, we defined in, in the motor framework and which came from the part, uh, participatory water management rules. So when local people will answer this question, so we will ask them to answer or, uh, or, or there is a, a measuring scale that will help uh, help them to measure their uh, their rate of uh, their degree of knowledge. So that measuring scale is a number uh, based on number. So that number is actually the cardinal number and it starts from zero and the maximum uh, score could be the could be five. 
So zero means no knowledge and five means they have very complete and comprehensive knowledge. So this is just one example. So we, we, we are trying to explaining this indicator uh, in this way, each of these indicator in this way. And now then we will aggregate the final score and uh, based on the weighted average method and weight will be calculated, uh, have already been calculated by the expert opinion during our motor training workshop. So as I mentioned here, uh, like is it uh, applicable? Uh, like whether these motor indicators are applicable? We actually conducted a, um, a two day uh, workshop, a training workshop plus the expert, uh, interactive expert group workshop. So in that two, uh, two days training workshop, the first, in first day, we were focused on uh, introducing the motor and train them on how to use this uh, indicator framework. And on the second day, we actually led uh, the, uh, the participants to work on that indicator framework. We grouped the participants into uh, seven groups uh, based on like a small farmer, medium farmer, larger farmer, and so on. And then experts actually were uh, uh, discussed within within the group and they tried to quantify the indicator based on our those questionnaire and measuring scale and they uh, they presented their result in front of others and there was a cross discussion and again this group had the opportunity to to revise their uh, questionnaire uh, revise their scores if they wanted to and i will share just one uh, one raw result from them from from that uh, uh, the training workshop if you see uh, uh, the draft you can see like uh, it explains the aggregate score of different motor ability of different groups and uh, we know like uh, the ability of different groups should be different so we, uh, so our our results from that experts opinion also reflect that the ability of the different group is different and uh, we know like this is not the actual this might not be the actual score, might be different from the uh, local people opinion, but still it, it gives the, or give us uh, feedback that okay, our indicators are working. And uh, according to their opinion, the highest score came from the community based organization and NGO group. And the lowest score, that means lowest ability score came from the uh, group representing them as a small farmer, a small land, uh, land ownership. And landowner and farmer. So our next step is we want to go to the uh, community level and we want to conduct a city at community level to, to uh, do the survey and come up with the similar uh, indicate, uh, quantified indicators. And if we see like the, that uh, uh, the score we will receive from the community level is matching with the, with the score we have already received from the uh, expert opinion, then we can also propose that interactive expert group opinion can be used as an alternative. And uh, if you see the another group where I tried to uh, uh, show the like motor ability score of different group, and they, uh, you'll see like zero means no ability and five means the highest ability to participate with comprehensive fist capacity. So in that. Uh, in that figure, you will see the community-based organization and NGOs showed the highest uh, capacity to participate, and the small farmer are showing the lowest capacity. So this is uh, uh, this is all from our uh, uh, quick presentation. Uh, our research is, is, is still progressing, and uh, we hope to um, conduct the survey in 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 the coming months. So that's all from now. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Shibli. That was a, that was a very nice presentation and very well timed. We've got uh, time for one or two questions. So uh, Leon Leon has posed a question, and one is. Uh, so the question one is beyond community FGDs, do you also plan um, survey questionnaires within the communities? Do you also plan to do survey questionnaires within the communities? I see. Like, uh, I think he wanted to mean whether we have planned to do a household level questionnaire survey or not. Yeah, that's uh, I think that's broader. Uh, 
yeah, we are still discussing about that issue, but depending on the present pandemic situation, we are thinking like uh, that might be difficult or not. But uh, again, when we designed the indicators or identified the indicators, we actually targeted FGD. And uh, because th that will be uh, relatively uh, quicker. And since we are planning to implement this uh, or use this tool at the strategic planning level, I think in that case, like uh, FGD is that enough. Okay. okay. Uh, and the, the, the second question is, how would the results be used? How do you think the results would be used to improve participatory water management policy in Bangladesh? So what, yeah, what do you envision going forward with this? Yes, to answer that question, like I again uh, want to show this framework, like If you if you see like uh, we have uh, explained the or we have translated the uh, ability component into different indicators, and when we we'll, uh, and our uh, of course or our survey actually give the uh, measurement of each indicator. That means we will able to know uh, how these indicators are working there, right? Or what is the present status of the, the, each of the indicators? So based on that that result, I think the uh, implementing agency can design uh, design uh, how to improve, for example, how to improve their ability. Uh, if if they think or if they find like technical ability is very low, then they they can come up with some new uh, uh, new program how to enhance the technical ability of the local people. If, if the result says that institutional ability is very low, and we already have two indicators like. One of the indicators is uh, the status of one indicator is very low. Then they can target the, how to improve that indicator. So yeah, in that way, I think that uh, this this result will help the improvement of our city water management. Thanks, Shibley, for that answer. Uh, we have time for another question, and Mike Acaster has proposed a question. Asking, did you see a difference between rice farmers and rice fish farmers? Did you break it down into further than just farmers? And was there a difference or? Uh, I think, yes, uh, so, yeah. I, uh, like here, it will be a little bit difficult to understand, but uh, for our paper, we are trying to discuss our we have a plan to discuss or make a difference between rice farmer and shrimp farmer. And this is very interesting. Uh, though it's not possible to see from this graph, but uh, from my pre preliminary result and, uh, that, and in the training workshop, we have found that uh, shrimp farmer they they have a better institutional capacity than the rice farmer because uh, according to them, like and also their social capacity is stronger than rice farmer because they have a very good link with the implementing agency and uh, outside network and even the shrimp farmer has very a strong uh, association so there are yeah of course there are some difference between rice farmer and shrimp farmer and uh, we are trying to actually now seeing our result and to explain what are the differences okay uh, and one final question before we move on to the second is just uh, with one minute to spare is from Nora and she said, did I understand correct that you want to move from a self-assessment of motor to an interactive uh, expert assessment? And then what do you see as the advantage or the drawbacks of using an expert-based approach? I mean, self-assessment means, uh, I mean, these the, sources were coming from the expert's opinion, not myself. Yes. So this is uh, their opinion. And uh, when they actually frame that opinion, or, uh, when they quantified those indicators, they actually discussed in a group and they shared their result with other groups. So there was a very good cross discussion and motion in, in that group. And after that discussion, they again went back to their group and uh, if they wanted, they could revise their scores. So it's truly, it's truly reflected their opinion. 
So now our plan is to go to the field and uh, talk with the local people. And then we will see how, whether these uh, escorts and uh, like escorts we will get from the local people, whether that escort is matches with uh, matches with the, with the score we have received from the expert opinion. And if we think yeah. like the schools are very close, then we can make that comment. Yeah, so you're, you're using a cross comparison um, approach to, to test if the expert analysis is, uh, is correct. Yeah, this is so far we have that plan, but yeah, yeah we will try. All right, Chip, it'll be very interesting. And I would actually like to ask a final question, but I will ask it to you offline about the roles of CSOs as they have high. Uh, high capacity and ability, but I will ask you that later so we can move on to the second uh, to the second talk. So thank you very much for that. That's very interesting. Uh, we will now move on to talk two. And I will say also that if you have questions about these different talks, you can also put those into, into the chat box and we will pose them separately if we don't have time, we can pose those separately to the speakers as well, that they will come back to you with the answers as we're going through the different talks. So the second speaker is uh, is Quan, um, and he will be giving a presentation on the motor applications and the experience from Vietnam, and that's where so motor was developed originally in me uh, in Vietnam, and so Quan's going to present that experience and then Quan's background is uh, he's currently an associate professor at the Vietnam National University, Ho Chi Minh City and he's leading an established, uh, a newly established institute for the circular economy development uh, and he's also affiliated with the socio, socio hydrology group at the Centre of Water Management and Climate Change. But I think that Quan, you're actually the director now. Is that correct? I think this is, uh, yeah. So actually, Quan is the director now of uh, uh, taken over from, from uh, Professor Fee at the uh, yeah at the Water Management and Climate Change um, Institute, and he has a special interest in solving environmental related issues based on inter and transdisciplinary study and by strong partnership between academia, industry and government. So very interesting background. Quan, and we're looking very much forward to this to this talk. Can you just let us know, are you able to, to bring it up to share or should we uh, should we do it in another way? Are you able to share your screen? Yeah, yeah, I'm sharing my screen. Oh, yeah. So it's working good. Yeah, can you see, yeah, you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, hello, everyone. So it's my uh, uh, honor to to give presentation in this uh, second webinar on the MOTA series. So I did actually uh, also the first uh, one presentation in in the first one. So and it was mainly uh, about for, for the Mekong Delta. So now I'm trying to give you some more applications of uh, the MOTA framework that we have been working together with uh, different group and uh, not only our researcher but also uh, with our students <laughs> yeah so i will give you a short introduction again uh, i think i will talk quickly about the motor but also some updated uh, especially uh, uh, from professor fee uh, some uh, new components and yeah and i will share with you a few examples in different sectors in water agricultural infrastructures ecology is related and urban is related and a few conclusions yeah i think uh, i will start with some questions about assemble what are valuable tools for making decisions and why we see that some plan cannot or just partly implemented or is failed in implementations why good solutions are not always a choice i would be able to build consensus in project planning and implementations 
there is harm to final outcome. So there are a number of questions related to decision making in terms of uh, project uh, plannings and implementations that uh, we can, uh, uh, we have to deal with uh, during our normal practice. Yeah, I think this one maybe some of you already seen. So there are different, uh, most of like um, academy or professional are looking at most likely the performance of the projects. We're using different tools like cost benefits analysis or multi criteria analysis, robot disease making, looking at more on the performance side based on more like quantitative uh, indicators. But then um, there are some other side that we need to go on so far like implementations, abilities, or adaptability, which is uh, the next phase of, uh, of the planning. So normally the professional, there what should be done as the planning and authority. We are talking about uh, our government projects, decide what can be done. So but depend on the availabilities and the society, community, adopt what they want and what they can, because it's adoption. So uh, this is a post after the project implementations. So this is the a little updated um, motor framework from fee. So which uh, here we put more on what is the triggers can be social, economics, environmental or physical factors. And the motivation can be negative, positive, passive, active. Ability is now here, including finance, institution, technical society. And the action to be made is yeah, can be what, when, how, and who should be involved in different stage of the projects. So uh, here you now uh, in the past we use like performance, uh, feasibility from authority or social adaptabilities, and recently we also includes the new angles of uh, of, uh, of of the mota is a popularity, which is we include the business or uh, industry uh, groups. So in different uh, uh, aspect of the mota from professional authorities or social or business, there could be uh, uh, some uh, factors affect to uh, this um, the, the, the motor. <laughs> so actually this is from the last presentation from fee, so you can sit back. And importantly, I think uh, the motor, especially the motor mapping is uh, can be have in uh, consensus buildings. If you look at the horizontal uh, direction, so there are different uh, people have different motivation. So if we know where they are and we can build the consensus. Also, when you look at the vertical um, assets, you see the ability of different groups. So we have to consider it uh, to build the capacity. Yeah, so I'm sharing with you uh, the number of applications. Uh, in terms of this, I tried uh, the first one is about water agriculture. Uh, this is under you know, preparation for journal submission, where we try to investigate the impact of uh, historical change in relation to uh, the livelihood condition and uh, farm adaptation. So this is uh, um, um, uh, a slug get uh, project in the Mekong Delta, where we build uh, the they, they build a project to to uh, prevent saline water into the areas. So the the in, and the impact of this loot gas makes the change of hydraulic conditions. So some areas was fresh water, but now it becomes saline, or maybe some saline now becomes fresh. So the, this changes the livelihoods of, of the people. So in this, we uh, conduct the motor framework based on two steps. The first is the, we do the focus group discussion, uh, which you see the four uh, pictures and satellite image where we use this to discuss with uh, four group in uh, four area, uh, four communes in the areas uh, to understand more about the situation. And then based on that, we develop a questionnaire and we did the, about more than 100 in-depth interview with uh, different farmers in these uh, areas. Yeah, so in this one, we try to see how uh, they understand the, the situation of the hydrological conditions and also the, perform, uh, the perception of farmer about different uh, factors uh, in terms of uh, uh, water for crops or access to water crop, access to water crop when the project finished and uh, access to water crop when uh, after, after the projects. 
in this we uh, also map uh, the motor in different groups uh, uh, how they perceive and uh, how they uh, how the farmers um, uh, had their uh, motivation and abilities in terms of uh, after the projects how they sustain the current crop or are they or are they spend do they spend the currents or they have or they have to transform into a, a new crop so the, so you see the and the motivation map, um, motor map of different group are quite diverse, yeah. yeah because and also the, the 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 complexity of the couple social hierarchical system. Uh, the second uh, application is related to ecology. So here we try to see the because uh, this the, the picture you see is the mangrove uh, forest. But actually, it's not only the mangroves, there's rim there. So mangroves rim is, uh, have been uh, identified as one of the potential livelihoods uh, in the coastal area where the, uh, in terms of natural, conserve, uh, natural uh, preservation, but also improve the local livelihoods. It's quite promising, but uh, uh, are this really uh, sustainable or how the, the farmers there uh, uh, are they really happy to to uh, to sustain with this uh, more uh, with this livelihoods? So in this, we try to to combine uh, uh, both uh, the motor and the so-called sustainable livelihood framework. So we try to assess different capitals from uh, social, physical, or uh, natural capitals and five capitals uh, of, of of the farmers who are living in these uh, uh, areas, and we, and then we assess how uh, people are really uh, interest or sustain or with this uh, uh, livelihoods. Yeah, so you see, we and uh, in this we combine the motor and the uh, sustainable livelihood framework. So we calculate uh, the, the capitals of different uh, capitals, also assessing the risk or uh, they they feel about different aspect in terms of uh, water pollution or uh, disease or whatever. And you can also see the the motor maps where you also see the uh, people have uh, uh, different uh, motivation in either sustaining the the current model or the other ones to 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 change into other uh, models so basically in the upper part on the right side you see most of people uh, still have motive highly motivated to and also ability to continue uh, with with this framework uh, with this as uh, macro stream uh, models Another application in ecological related is uh, how we assess the impacts on, uh, of uh, what pollution from agriculture activity into the so-called Changjim uh, ecological preservation areas in uh, Mekong uh, deltas. So there are a number of uh, farm agriculture practice like aquacultures where you see the red uh, pond is aquacultures and rice and other activities uh, that then um, trans the wastewater into the uh, into the, the 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 Ramsar site. So in this one, we we, we see we try to understand uh, how to have how farmer can and can change their behavior in protecting the surface water uh, quality in in the areas. Uh, yeah. So you see actually where we did a number of water uh, sampling uh, quality sampling, and you see the red color is. Uh, uh, polluted, which is uh, exceed the, you know, the water quality standards. So in this one, we try to see uh, combine a bit uh, like the motor framework and the uh, ecosystem service, which is based on the perception of the farmers living around areas. If they really have uh, a, a, a good perception about the importance of the uh, natural preservation areas. Yeah, so you see here we we as uh, we see the we do the interview and we see the um, uh, people how the difference uh, uh, in terms of the buffer zones uh, from the local from the areas to uh, uh, it's surrounding from few hundred meters to up to six thousand uh, meters and you see that um, people who are really uh, they they have a good. Uh, uh, of course, you see the uh, clearly who are living further from the areas. They have uh, less uh, perception on the importance uh, of the 
uh, of the natural uh, conservation areas. And also in this, we tried uh, to uh, assess the uh, different uh, motiva uh, uh, um, agricultural uh, practice. So in this one, we try, uh, it's just a sample. We have another for rice farming. We also have another one for aquaculture. So we try to understand, um, to, to see how farmers uh, um, interest or uh, in term of uh, reducing, uh, using uh, fertilized or, or pesticides in term of some uh, improved uh, agriculture practice, more clean, uh, uh, toward more clean um, uh, practice. But you see there are still quite a bit uh, diverse uh, which amongst the farmers uh, in reducing uh, fertilizer or pesticide. Also, uh, reducing pesticide is more uh, than in fertilizer, maybe because of uh, uh, the impact of uh, health to the, the health, so their motivation. But they still uh, quite, in terms of the ability, is still quite uh, diverse. So people are not really have ability to change agriculture, their agriculture practice. Uh, another, the third uh, application is related to urban uh, flooding areas. So this is already public. Um, uh, uh, earlier last year, about uh, we assess how the uh, different stakeholders in Ho Chi Minh City uh, respond to urban flood uh, using different green infrastructures from rain harvesting or urban green space or previous pavement or, or green roof. Uh, so in this, we uh, we um, we survey and we uh, do the interview with uh, different stakeholders. Actually, this uh, project is uh, is a part of uh, one of our master students uh, this uh, at that time. So we try to see uh, the the motivation of uh, selecting the, uh, different um, uh, retrofitting measures uh, from conventional drainage to some others uh, more green uh, infrastructures. So uh, you see that also quite. Uh, <coughs> A diverse or different uh, group, but most likely they are uh, supporting the, the motivation is supporting the green infrastructure, but they are still uh, very much um, uh, still very much uh, uh, prefer some very conventional one, which is most likely uh, extending uh, the, the drainage system. So we also map the kind of what could be the, the in, in the first state, they're now still convention. Uh, rainy system, maybe in the middle term, maybe there would be like local detention uh, measure, but uh, rain harvesting or green roof would be a bit further in the uh, with more long term. So, uh, the behavior, I mean, the perception on green structures from uh, different group from local government to mass media or to other uh, uh, groups uh, <coughs> are quite different. Uh, this is another case where uh, we also apply uh, the MOTA framework to see how uh, the private sectors interest in uh, blue-green infrastructures. Uh, in this, we uh, actually did also um, thesis uh, from uh, Kailati from uh, uh, ICD of an Iramoji University who did CD uh, thesis here. And uh, in this, we uh, actually we combine uh, the uh, risk or analysis and the motor uh, um, of different stakeholders, including uh, construction specialists who are most from invent, invest, um, uh, investor and authority and the rest is how they perceive about the green infrastructure part their developments. Uh, so uh, you see that because of the and we will most likely looking at the business group. Um, we try to come the risk and um, in terms of investment uh, to uh, support the investment. So uh, uh, They mentioned about financial 
of uh, the need uh, initial is uh, financial to invest in green blues uh, green infrastructure and uh, other risks like in finance operational risk or operational incentive or intangible risk so we uh, are looking at the uh, difference um, uh, incentive and risk considered from uh, by uh, different sectors uh, yeah and then also we maps uh, uh, the mot um, the motivation and abilities of different uh, stakeholders from private sectors and local occupants uh, which is residents and local authorities about them motivated or uh, motivation and ability in terms of uh, uh, investment on green blue in infrastructures and and you see there are also quite a, a diverse uh, uh, among different groups from very supportive and also to uh, to oppose uh, these green blue infrastructures so uh, it is mean you know in in, uh, in Vietnam or at least here in Ho Chi Minh City uh, the, the green blue are still quite controversies to different uh, group of uh, peoples yeah so I'm trying to give you some example of uh, our application of quota in, in here in Vietnam and uh, you see that you can apply in, in different stages of the project cycles and also and can be also in context from ecology to water infrastructures urban flood measurements and you see that the, from the motor you see that the score is nice among stakeholders is um, by basic uh, building and on prioritizing uh, measure both in the source um, long, a long time. And uh, here we apply combined with the others. Here we saw that it can be with the livelihood framework or the system services. Uh, this can give more the context. Yeah, uh, I think it's uh, a slide. Thank you very much for your listening. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Quan. That was very interesting talk, and I think it really shows the flexibility um, and the compatibility of MOTA uh, as a stand to standalone tool by itself, but also that you can integrate it with other tools to dependent on the situation that you're in. So we have some time for questions. So uh, there's a question from Mike Akis. Uh, around Bayesian belief networks and that a, a, a Griffith University in Australia is working with Kanto University in Vietnam on a probability model based on farmer information uh, on freshwater availability for shrimp success under climate change. Are you, have you looked at uh, this model or have you looked at Bayesian belief network models um, as part of your experience? Um, uh, John, uh, sorry. Uh, um, can, can you say again? I am really not... Yeah, really so, so it was just a question from, from Mike. He was asking about there's been an application of Bayesian belief network uh, okay. modeling. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Then, I, I see yeah. The question from uh, Michael. Yeah, um, um, uh, I actually I don't know much about the uh, Bayesian uh, belief uh, network. I, I expect that this is a very interesting uh, tools, and uh, it's um, I, I know some people are working on that. Uh, yeah, and um, I think um, uh, um, I'm not sure if. Uh, Actually, not only Kanto and Grief, but I think there are some other group uh, also working on the Bayesian uh, Belief Network. And um, they, they do a lot, especially for understanding the, the farmers' uh, behaviors uh, in, the, in the coastal areas of the Mekong Delta. So there are also some other framework have been uh, developing there, including like agents-based uh, modelings, 
to see the behaviors of of the farmers so uh, there's another i think also a group from queensland university also working on Bayesian belief network on on mangroves uh, preservation in in the mekong delta too um i, I don't uh, really get insight about the their, their work yet but i think uh, uh, i know they are existing so thanks mike I'm not sure if i get your uh, points no that's that's correct Con. and uh, and the university you are talking about is griffith university uh yeah. from australia working in um working on Bayesian belief network <laughs> and it's an interesting question between motor and Bayesian belief networks about also the information I think from motor can feed directly into Bayesian belief networks to strengthen the information that is that is being put in there so I, I do see those also or that as also a complementary uh, that motor and Bayesian can also be complementary to each other for sure yeah. and I don't know whether you have or Leon or anyone you have worked uh, yeah within that space but I yeah I've worked in Bayesian before and uh, and I see motor actually being able to produce a lot of really good quantitative information that could be used in Bayesian belief uh, networks so we've got another five minutes of questions for here um, I posed a question, Quan, on some of the groups of farmers had very high ability and very high motivation. And I wanted to know, do you intend or do the authorities intend to work with those farmers so that they work with the other farmers that have um, less ability and less motivation? Is there is there a, yeah, an idea that you would use your strong farmers to work with the uh, less enthusiastic or weaker farmers? Is there something around that as champions? Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a very uh, good question, and I think this also um, something that we are now uh, uh, start something like like we develop something like a, a kind of pilot in in changing uh, the, the or transforming the the livelihoods. So we need to identify who's uh, the the champions, and we can work with them to for for example on the new livelihoods. Yeah, changing changing from this to another one. Uh, then uh, with with this one uh, we can start with them and with them if we come up with some good results and then uh, all the farmers uh, will follow because uh, the farmer are still you know very hesitant to to change their, their livelihoods because the changing practice changing things is is, is not uh, easy so uh, yeah but we very often uh, often in some areas we have the champions who have um, interest in new things and new market and new practice yeah so uh yeah especially now in the mekong delta we are trying to to get more young people go back to the uh to the countryside yeah and and with these people we we hope very much that they will be uh the leading group so in um, in doing some something new of example testing uh, the, the the new policy or uh, on, on on agriculture um, uh, practice yeah yeah so uh, again so if we if we have sometimes you know when we apply the the motor framework we can see different uh, groups it can be from different sector but can be also within the sectors so we identify who they are and we can start piloting with some who like the most uh, followers uh, are the most supporter groups uh, to test mm. the new policy to test the new practice and uh, it's, it's so the evident to other uh, groups that uh, that the way the, what we're doing here is, is good so that uh, other people uh, will follow so of course it will take some more time uh, in implementing the new policy but Medicine uh, will be more, you know, uh, um, sustainable in terms of, yeah, we don't have to change the whole livelihoods. For example, in the water infrastructures project I mentioned. So when they build, build the sluice gate, it means 
they change completely the water conditions. And many people there is they're not able to change their livelihoods because like they already uh, working with saline water. Now the fresh water, they are not really familiar with the dry practice. They was with uh, swim and now they, they cannot do it. Yeah. So um, yeah, so I think uh, the champion. Yeah, that's, very, that's very interesting, Quan, and, uh, and to, to also explore that the aspect of motor being able to identify champions and also innovators, I think, is uh, to be able to test, to pilot test new policy or, or new legislation. I think that's actually a very good, a very good insight um, into the the application of what motor can can help you can help you to do. Uh, and it fits also with another technique of, called the fusion of innovation. Um, which, uh, yeah, which I think is another interesting technique that can that can help um, within motor as well. Just quickly, there was one last question from from Leon, and I thought it was a very interesting one about. So the results that you have got from your different case studies, just quickly, how have they been received? by the decision makers? Does it influence their planning? Is that, uh, have you found that, it, that the information you gather is influencing the decision maker to change their plans or to modify their plans as yet? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a bit because most, most likely our work is, uh, is like uh, it's a research project. So we are not really uh, work uh, together with the, the, the governments uh, about that. So actually, one of the dreams that we uh, like very much is that the motor can be used at one of the tunes uh, to go together with others um, uh, projects, uh, procedures. So, for example, you have like um, uh, as a tune required for, for, for example, environmental impact assessment. So if we can include this and then uh, and then we can go with uh, uh, with uh, with and the real projects and i think we we can we can uh use that yeah uh, but uh, to really affect to the policy is it, not easy but um, but uh, we also joined for example uh, some uh, last project with the work bank uh, groups uh in terms also on agriculture's uh, um, uh transformation in in the mekong delta and uh, uh, one some of our finding was uh, in, so introduced in the in the um, in the work, uh, work bank report. So yeah, and now uh, and uh, I, I hope this uh, was uh, taken into account uh, into the uh, this is making progress in in the Mekong Delta. So actually, this one is still under uh, under final consultations. So. Uh, we work together with the Institute for Agriculture Policies in Hanoi and uh, in the final stage uh, of a consultation. So I hope uh, our finding was there and uh, was also presented uh, to, to the government. So, Thank you, Kwan. That's very interesting. Uh, it will be interesting to follow up also to see, uh, to see if that has influenced um, their decision making. So thank you, Kwan. We will move on to our next talk, which is talk number three, and a different, uh, moving on to our, also our topic number two, and it's uh, around motor and similar methods. So Leon is going to present here, and just some background on Leon is that, so he works for at IHE Delft and also TU Delft in the Netherlands. And his research and teaching focuses on policy analysis and evaluation of water management in multi-actor systems. Uh, and with his colleagues, he wrote a book on actor and strategy models, which was published in 2018. And you will see from the presentations that have gone on from also from webinar one and webinar two that the group that is working around motor is very diverse from an engineering to, to natural science to uh, social science scientists as well. And, um, and I think that shows the, one of the strengths of motor that it really takes that interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approach to, to finding out the, 
you know, what is it that motivates and what are the abilities of people? So thank you very much, Leon. Um, yeah, we look forward to, to hearing this talk. Yeah, I was trying to unmute, but somehow it didn't work. So I stopped presenting, but I will start it up again. So uh, okay. uh, bear That's with fine. me. Yeah. Yeah. And then I hope we are good to go uh, like this. Uh, okay. So uh, so so thank you, John, for introducing me. Um, with this talk, I would like to uh, shed some light on the position of MOTA in the larger landscape of what I would call model-based actor analysis or, or actor and strategy models. Um, because also, as we have already heard in today's webinar, there are a lot of similar methods and approaches out there. Uh, we have just now discussed Bayesian belief networks also applied in, in Vietnam. But there, there are, in fact, many other um, similar methods and, and models out there. And I think putting um, them on sort of a, a map, a mental map for ourselves, will help to see how um, these models and MOTA can benefit from each other, can complement each other, and how this can perhaps also uh, inspire some cross-fertilization um, to improve these, these models for both science and for um, planning. So, I want to uh, quickly go over the, the first few slides because they are mainly an introduction that I think um, may not be needed for this particular group. Uh, I think we all realize that beyond uh, affordable, cheap, good technologies for water management, the human factor is also quite important to make sure that users um, accept these new technologies, but also to ensure that we have organizations and institutions in place to deliver these technologies and to maintain them during their lifetime. Um, and even if we would have these institutions and organizations in place, even then the human factor uh, or the organizational factor remains important um, because the way that organizations operationalize the policies and apply them to specific areas may have an important impact to the actual water that is being delivered to users or that is available for uh, various societal values and, and uh, ecosystems. Um, so these, these two very short examples on these slides will help to, to illustrate that. I will not share the details, but if you are interested, the slides will be put on the website and the links are there with, with details on these two particular short cases as, as illustration. Um, and that, of course, that importance of the human factor raises the question, can we then also model, quantify, and even predict what happens uh, around these, these, these human dimensions? Um, when we first uh, started with MOTA, when, when, when Professor Fee first launched the idea, and especially the idea of, of making it very quantitative, um, many, many uh, initial reactions were a bit skeptic because there is, is a widespread um, presumption that when it has to do with human behavior, quantification and, and prediction is not something that, that is really feasible or sensible. Um, but I would like to, to, to turn it around. If we can uh, quantify and, and model all kinds of complex physical and, and socio-technical systems that, that we also don't fully understand to the lowest, lowest level of, of detail and, and, and um, the full complexity of all these linked models, then why not um, give a go also at modeling this human factor? Because in fact, we know now that also human behaviors are structured. They are not purely random. Um, so there are things that condition human behavior. There are things that we know drives human behavior. So why not try capture those in, in models as well? And in fact, in planning and decision-making, we often refer to these cost-benefit analysis. But of course, that is nothing more than applying a very coarse economic model 
and an economic model is a model of society and of social uh, processes into planning. So let's let's see and if we can do a better job with the theoretical knowledge and the models that have been developed around this human factor before. Um, MOTA is definitely one of them and there are actually quite a few more. If we want to uh, make this into a serious endeavor, I think it does help to have a conceptual map in which we can um, uh, locate the things that we would want to model and that we would want to develop theories and models for. One thing, which is I think the thinking closest to, to many of the uh, water experts and engineers in the water field, is to think of, of a socio-technical water system, a system of interest, I would call it as, as more general policy analysis terminology. The system of reality that we are interested to um, to solve problems for, to improve the management for. And of course, that system is not a purely physical or technical system, but it will include social, institutional and economical components. And the actors or stakeholders that are active in those systems of interest, I think are aptly called system agents. But of course, if we are interested in planning decision-making policy analysis governance, then we also need to consider another system, which is, uh, you, could, you could give it various labels. I've called it a decision arena, uh, following especially some work from uh, Eleanor Ostrom and similar policy analysts and, and institutional um, theorists. And in that decision arena, there are another type of stakeholders active, which you could call strategic actors. They interact also with each other on how to make decisions and how to make policies to manage and influence that system of in interest. And those are typically two different types of, of actors or stakeholders, if, if you want. And I think if we are thinking of um, quantitative models of stakeholders of this human factor, it is really important that we uh, distinguish between those two types of um, systems, because in a decision arena, we have fewer numbers of strategic stakeholders, more, more differences in interests and their abilities among them. Uh, so typically perhaps requiring different types of approaches from the system agents, like consumers, uh, farmers, households, water users, that individually may not have a significant influence on the system. If one farmer decides to change irrigation practices, um, at the, the level of the river basin, we will not notice. But of course, if multiple farmers collectively start doing this, then through emergence, we do see an influence. But that is an important difference requiring different types of, of methods. So far, the MOTA methods that we have seen uh, and, and developed focus on societal adaptability among farmers, among water users, among um, the private sector. Um, and um, we have seen some early applications of implementability on the arrow between the decision arena and the system of interest. Because even if a decision is made and the policy is, is decided, implementing that policy also requires again, different types of stakeholders to um, become active and organize or at least um, configure themselves in what you could say is an implementation trajectory. There we have seen motor applications, um, but there are many other uh, models uh, around that we could consider using. Typically, these models are developed more for certain application types than others, but as with all models, all these models can also be stretched and adapted for other uses. Um, the list on this slide is definitely not um, complete, but, but it will at least give you an idea of, of some of the models that, that we have. And what I would say are actor and strategy models um, are those models that not just assume some kind of bounded rationality, so not full rationality in the classic economic sense, but we do assume that stakeholders um, take their actions to um, ensure that values and things that matter to them are catered for or are taken into account. And um, more particularly, we are interested because of resource dependence. What one stakeholder or one strategic actor does can influence 
the values and the objectives or, or achieving the goals of another actor. And that is something we could model and we could perhaps also model a bit further than what is currently contained in, in MOTA uh, methods. Um, so to just give you one example of, of, of the potential, one very simple e example of the potential, and that will be the last part of this, uh, of this short introduction. Um, consider nature-based flood defenses. This is a case from the Netherlands, but in, in other countries you could think of, of similar uh, structures where we have a dike or a, a hard infrastructure type flood defense protecting um, some land behind it, agricultural land, urban areas. And in front of the dike, there might be some um, nature-based uh, vegetated area, a foreshore like a mud flat uh, or a mangrove in other countries uh, and other places of the world. And of course, that has a flood protection function as well. And we could also use it for that function as a multifunctional area. Of course, when you want to do that, it requires cooperation. It's not just the flood protection authority in charge of maintaining the dike, but it then also will involve perhaps the nature authorities in charge of the area at the sea side of the dike and the authorities and stakeholders active behind the dike um, uh, for, for the values that they care about. We can make a stakeholder map. We could even perhaps further quantify it with, uh, with tools like MOTA, but we can also make a model to test some of the assumptions we have about how these kind of structures could be implemented in these um, uh, stakeholder systems, in these governance systems. And in this particular project, um, we, we assumed within the project team and within the, the participating government authorities that if we want to test this, um, the, this new type of flood defense in reality and see how it works and how stakeholders negotiate over it, but also to, to learn about its impacts more, we need to go for um, economies of scale. So we need to go for a good chunk of, of land in front of a dike where we could expect actually quite some benefits of interest to quite a few stakeholders as, as a good starting point and also to be able to observe these, these effects. We tested this first very simple assumption, which was very essential to, to the project, as you can imagine, with a very, very simple um, actor model using, using game theory. And we just tested, is it better to go with a small foreshore or with a large foreshore um, as a pilot area in this project? And this very simple game theory model showed us that, that the additional assumption in the project team and with the water authority was actually not uh, the smartest thing to do. And once you realize that, you can also see why that is. But of course, to, to first prove your initial assumptions wrong, these models can help a big deal. I will not go into the technicalities, but the insight from this model um, was that if we have a larger foreshore there, then also much more is at stake, not just for the water authority, but also for the nature organization that is in charge of, um, that owns this, this foreshore. And um, expecting them to change their operations in a still uncertain situation might not be something they are readily willing to commit to if it is a large piece of their land. And uh, that, that makes it easier to start with smaller pieces of land. That makes perfect sense. And once you know it, you will say, yes, of course, stupid. Why didn't you think of that before? But let me assure you that the thinking throughout the project team, including the, the water authorities and the municipalities, was to first look for larger pilot areas rather than smaller. And this um, signals the dangers in, in doing that. Um, of course, you can think of other types of models, like, for instance, these social network analysis, I think, would also make a good complement, perhaps, to MOTA, which could help you see what is the structure of your network, who connects different critical clusters. This is another type of project. I'll just want to show the, the, the illustration here. It was for a metropolitan region uh, around Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, but also MOTA, I think, can be seen as a model because behind the quantification is this conceptual model of the types of variables that influence motivation, ability, 
opportunity and trigger factors. This is uh, um, what was presented by Shibli earlier for, for Bangladesh. So also this, I think, is very useful to gain more insights into, into human uh, behavior. So with this, um, I've, I've, I've presented what I wanted to share with you as sort of an introduction to open up um, thinking about other similar or, or compatible models to MOTA to, um, to benefit further developments in this area. Uh, for further reading, I think um, the MOTA manual is definitely the first point to start on MOTA, but there is also some further reading if you are interested to, to read a bit more about these other types of models in, a, in an earlier publication that we did and that we also use in some of our teaching uh, in Delft. Okay, that was it. So. Um, over to to questions and uh, and discussion. Thank you, Leon. That was very interesting, uh, and it, I think that's one of probably one of the biggest questions I get about Moto being being a new application <clears throat> um, from our perspective in, at our institute and around uh, even within a, the Australian water management scene is. Uh, why MOTA and why not other models? And I think that's a, that's a question that we we have posed quite a bit. And then also complementary, yeah, complementary models to that. You know, MOTA strengthening one other application or an other application strengthening that. And <laughs> I have one question on on that that so. Within the stakeholder analysis and the context analysis component, what do you think is is one of those complementary applications, or whether it's game theory or whatever, that, that that is really able to help lead from that step one into step two? I think that that would really, for instance, for us who are just starting off, that would be helpful to get some insight into within the context analysis component. You know, what do you think is a complementary model within that? Well, so if, if I see the, the motor application, it, it starts al always with this context analysis to basically set up your your motor model and to decide on the variables and the kind of stakeholders you want to capture with, with MOTA. Um, what I would do and what we actually also do in, in our <laughs> teaching in, in Delft, both at IHE Delft and at, at TU Delft in, in the policy analysis program. Um, we do proceed MOTA, and that's also in, in the MOTA manual, in fact, uh, with a more general stakeholder analysis, just a scan of who are the stakeholders, why are they involved, what are their interests, and, and can we perhaps even map different arenas of, of stakeholders or different subsystems around that. But two other particular um, um, methods that are, or approaches that are very useful to complement MOTA with is to realize that we are not often not just interested in only these stakeholders, but we are interested in these stakeholders because we do think they influence a problem in our water system. So mm -hmm. for that matter, I do think it is also useful to make a simple conceptual uh, causal diagram of your socio-technical system. Just map it as you understand it, um, yeah. as, as, as your initial context uh, mapping tool, and to consider playing a bit perhaps with the longer term and the shorter term, um, especially if MOTA is for strategic planning, then the short term, long term trade-off or, or, or tensions are very important and what is a very useful and also very fairly simple tool is is, is uh, context scenarios um, and and play around a little bit with them and together the, these three methods I think will will inform a good design of a further MOTA study and then what what further kind of models or methods could be used to complement MOTA I think that that goes in further steps of MOTA step three or step four or step five and that would really depend on what you want to use MOTA for. I think one of the really strong points of MOTA, at least for me, is that it is quite close to the stakeholder analysis thinking that is so widespread, but it's just much more thorough about it. And I think the what Quan mentioned in his uh, discussion and as a 
proposal or as an idea from, from Professor Fee to, I think it does lend itself really well to integrate with uh, mainstream environmental impact assessment or social impact assessment practices. And I think those are really strong points for, for MOTA. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's a, that's a very nice answer and also very helpful for, for us who are moving into this context analysis uh, stage. So we can talk also about that more uh, through the group. So we have a few minutes. I want to ask one other question was the diagram you put up about the dike system um, and and creating the, the the wetland structures out the front of the of the protection area. Did, did the information that you came up with from Moda did it did it help to influence that decision making about large versus small? So did the authorities take that and say, okay, we'll we will only um, we will start small and not big. It well, that particular example was was at the start of the project, but and um, that influenced the authorities to take these kind of methods serious and to consider them. Um, the researchers took took their own pilots, um, regardless of the authorities. But in a in a later stage of that project, and partly because of these insights. Um, the main researcher on this project, Stephanie Janssen, who is now working with Deltares, she used game theory structures to design an interactive workshop in which all the regional stakeholders participated and together identified good promising next piloting steps to take this uh, approach further. And that was structured along the same uh, variables you would use for a game theory model yourself, but in an interactive format over two separate sessions in time. And out of that workshop, indeed, came some uh, decisions, including for, for how to approach these pilots that were taken up by the Regional Water Authority as part of their plan moving forward with this particular stretch of dike, which they also have to strengthen under Dutch policy. Okay, no, but that's very, for reasons yeah. of time, I decided not to present that full story. But yeah. eventually, yeah. so yes, it, it did help them actually. Yeah. Okay, that's great. And so Nora has one question before we move uh, into Nora's talk. It's in the chat box, and she says, "Thanks, Leon. Interesting to see these different actor models. Have you been able to make an analysis already on changes?" in, for example, social networks and what induced these changes. So, yeah. Yeah. Have you no, looked so, into that further? So the social network studies I have been involved with, mainly with with, uh, with graduate students or, or colleagues, uh, we have not done these more dynamic social network analysis, but really more the, the snapshots of the current situations, which are useful of their own, especially if you overlay perhaps different types of, of relations in the networks. Um, these dynamic social network analysis are also being done um, and I think can also be very useful, um, but there is a, 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 a caveat there that it is very difficult to get compar comparable data from perhaps one or five or ten years ago um, and now or, or perhaps even over time. Um, doing that would would, would would require a good design and and data set that you were then also perhaps constrained to rather than designing your own survey questionnaires and of course you can ask people about relations in the past but we know from social science research that those answers tend to be more biased and less accurate than than other answers um, what is also being done what i also see in in other colleagues do in other institutes to combine social network analysis with more modeling studies. And then, of course, you can, um, through your model, um, make these pictures a bit more dynamic and test your modeling assumptions as to what would change over time. Yeah. yeah okay, then. Thank you. So thank you for that. It was a very interesting, uh, very interesting talk. And I think it's something that we will also take forward with MOTA into the future as our group is here exploring, um, you know, and through the encouragement of also of uh, Dr. Fee on 
exploring how these different models fit together a complementary um yeah to the to the applications of motor so i look forward to to discussing that into the next into the next phase of this collaboration uh so nora is the next talk so this is our final talk and we're running very well to time and so nora is also going to talk about motor and similar methods and something that's called readiness levels uh, so Nora, she works at IHC Dell and VUB uh, KU Leuven University. Where uh, IHC Delft is in obviously in Delft, Netherlands, and then uh, KU Leuven is in uh, Belgium. And her research and teaching focuses on participatory decision support for natural resources management and governance. Uh, she has a key interest in the co-design of innovative yet implementable natural resource management systems considering different value systems. So this should be a very interesting talk. Thank you, Nora. Thank you, John, for this introduction. And uh, also thank you to the other speakers. I, um, I, I saw a lot of elements that I, I can build up on. So as uh, Leon, I'm going to talk about uh, similar methods to MOTA and um, the research that I'm presenting is coming from a Horizon 2020 project called NIAD that was looking at the insurance value of nature-based solutions. And so the challenge that we were having uh, in this project was to assess and demonstrate uh, that the insurance, but also the assurance value of ecosystems. So the assumption, um, as, as you know, as also was shown in, uh, by Leon and earlier by Kwan, is that ecosystems can contribute to mitigate extreme water risks and at the same time increase the resilience of a society in a context of climate change. And so what we want to do is to move from a situation now where insurance or risk reduction is a lot about gray and conventional infrastructure and move to insurance and assurance schemes where uh, nature or ecosystems have an active role. Yeah? And so the idea that we had was we have to show this assurance value of ecosystems. So the potential of the nature-based solutions to reduce damage costs related to floods and droughts, which was our focus, and then also to provide associated benefits as part of a natural assurance scheme. We did that looking at a number of uh, demos across Europe. So um, you see on the map here, the, 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 the demos were rather um, heterogeneous in terms of the type of hazard that was most important to them, drought, uh, floods, um, kind of uh, very, uh, very high intensity mountainous floods or more slow riverine floods. Um, the scales of the demos were different. Also, we had some urban demos, some rural demos, and then, of course, all of them were located in a very different social, political, and economic context. So how do we aim to move from uh, just assessing the performance of nature-based solutions to, to demonstrating really that uh, their assurance value through implementation? Uh, we were keeping uh, the end in mind. So what we were expected to do from the, the Horizon 2020 program, so from the research program, was to move up the technology readiness level of the nature-based solution. And that was also really the formulation that they used. So technology readiness level, uh, was developed by NASA in the 80s, and it's kind of a uh, indicator-based um, scale that shows uh, the maturity the, the maturity of a certain technology. And so here we said, okay, the nature-based solution is an innovative technology to deal with water-related risks, and we have to bring that up the scale. We had to do that for different types of nature-based solutions in different contexts, working with different disciplines. Um, and so what we wanted to do is to define a roadmap to have an evidence-based discussion on the co-benefits of nature-based solution, or even to go a step further and to discuss action plans on how to implement this nature-based solution, or the final step, what we really were after, was to actually come to a full implementation of these nature-based solutions in some of our demos. And so we had to develop strategies to overcome implementation barriers and come to a sort of a, a, a nice approach to nature-based solution and natural assurance scheme planning and implementation. So where we wanted to go with that, we wanted to have these nature-based solutions implemented. 
But then uh, we also realized, and this is based on a very extensive literature review, many projects on nature-based solutions that have happened already, um, the kind of barriers that exist to get these things implemented. And we identified four main ca categories. So you have your institutional, your regulatory barriers. You have, obviously, the funding and financing barriers. You have knowledge and acceptance barriers, and then also the absence of a clear evaluation of the performance itself. So in implementing the nature-based solution, what we have to actually do is to overcome those barriers and to manage uncertainties to move to higher readiness levels. And doing so uh, can, is really depending on engaging in an in interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary dialogue. And what we suggested as a way to have such a dialogue was the participatory planning framework. Now, this may look very obvious also to this group, but in our project where we were coming from a lot of different disciplines, a lot of people coming from the disaster risk reduction world, um, from all sorts of uh, other approaches to risk, um, this forward-looking idea of planning was something a bit new to them. So. We proposed this because we wanted to have a shift from an ex post response, where you just come in after a disaster has happened, to an ex ante a mitigation adaptation approach. Um, we wanted it to be an adaptive uh, framework because there's a lot of uncertainties inherent to all sorts of interventions, but particularly also with nature based solutions being a living uh, solution where we don't yet have a lot of evidence of longer term performance. We needed a flexible approach to handle those uncertainties and uh, also from the idea that it is more important to manage uncertainties than to reduce them. And finally, the participatory aspect of, of course, is uh, related to the importance of having the stakeholder engagement from a vision of the project to its implementation. And so what we wanted to do is to integrate a native-based solution into a participatory adaptive planning uh, approach. Um, just as kind of a short um, view of what that approach is about, probably known to many of you, but uh, in this planning approach, you kind of define different stages in which you gradually move from an inception of, uh, in this case, a nature-based solution, the context or situation analysis to building strategies around uh, potential interventions and a selection of, let's say, the most performant, the most desirable intervention. And then moving into the operational planning of how you're going to build, operate uh, such, uh, such a solution, a nature-based solution, with the final step, the implementation. Now, what is important to see here is the stakeholder engagement that goes across all of these steps and also the feedback loops or the, uh, of the adaptive uh, pathways that you can have um, where through the monitoring and evaluation of the performance, you can actually make changes in the way, for example, your nature-based solution is operated or is managed. So what did we learn from the demo site? Um, so we, we looked actually at our demo site kind of after they were um, being implemented or after it was designed. And we looked at the implementation of a nature, an existing nature-based solution through this participatory uh, adaptive planning lens. And what we did was to, for a few of the selected demo sites, because they were all at different stages of implementation, for the ones that were further advanced, we looked uh, back and to see, okay, how can we now understand the implementation? So we were recreating the storyline of how these nature-based solutions move from inception to implementation. Now, important to know is that this is kind of an artificial storyline that is beautifully going in a linear way. Of course, we know that reality is much more messy and what is happening in context analysis action plan is, is, is moving a bit across each other and it's also kind of a circular process. So <clears throat> the analysis method that we used is uh, to look throughout that implementation process at what kind of barriers and uncertainties appeared and how they were overcome. And then we looked at different types of uncertainty, so unpredictability, the incomplete knowledge, but also the uh, presence of multiple knowledge frames and ambiguity. And 
we were identifying what were the key success factors in overcoming uh, those barriers or managing that uh, uncertainty. We looked at how information was used and by whom and how elements of implementation uh, plan and the business models were already prepared in early stages of planning. And this is then a view of um, what such an ex post analysis looks like. So this is for the one uh, case uh, nature-based solution that we analyzed. Uh, for Rotterdam, an urban uh, rainwater harvesting project with some reuse for it. Um, and you can see here on the left side these different steps of uh, the planning process. And for each of uh, them, uh, we identified in yellow what were key success factors, red what were the barriers, uh, green what were drivers, and purple what are kind of enabling activities or agents of change. And as I said before, so you can see that this is not a nicely um, um, linear process. Yeah, we have already some action planning activities at the very start in 2015. But this, this analysis really helped us to kind of identify all the elements and see where um, barriers were overcome and what was kind of the, yeah, the key success factor for that. So we did this for different demos that were at different levels of technology readiness. We discussed experiences with stakeholders. And from those discussions, kind of the, the learning that we had was that if we want to move up uh, with readiness, uh, which was the initial kind of request from the, from the European Commission in the research proposal, okay, you have to come to demos that have a high technology readiness level. And what we realized when doing this, uh, this ex post analysis, and of course it's not a fantastically uh, super original uh, realization, but we, we managed to demonstrate rather nicely how that readiness is really a combination of knowledge, governance, and investment readiness. And so we were communicating as of then, not in terms of technology readiness alone, but also of investment readiness and institutional readiness. Having done quite some work on defining what is underlying uh, those readiness levels. And I think here, um, in relation to Malta, what is, um, what is interesting is, is to think about the levels of readiness, no? or the levels of motivation, or the levels of ability that you want to achieve, and how you can build it up and how you can also identify where you are and, and where you want to go. So one thing that we uh, did was then to say, OK, in this uh, process, this participatory adaptive process, actually, this is a process in which we are building up those different types of readiness. Yeah? So starting with technology readiness level, uh, that goes from the inception, context analysis, and the strategy building actually is when you already have to be at a very high uh, technology readiness. The investment readiness is something that is not just happening in the action planning. It's something that starts very early on as well in, in the inception, the discussion with stakeholders. Um, I don't have the detail here in this presentation, but we developed a a modified business canvas for natural assurance schemes. And we kind of showed how you build up that business canvas through uh, that planning process. And likewise with institutional readiness and the uh, uh, six components of that institutional readiness, um, we kind of uh, showed how this is happening through these different, uh, different uh, stages in, in the participatory adaptive planning process. Then I want to end with some uh, reflections on uh, so the readiness levels, the mode and the readiness level. So these readiness levels here is, is the interest for us and, and in the context of European research is to really kind of connect to a language that is used also already by policymakers. So if you think about the science policy interface, um, we need concepts that speak to different audiences. And, here, the investment readiness and institutional readiness, and, and particularly the underlying information of what consists uh, that and how you can build it up, was something very useful. Um, 
what was also shown is the importance of the process no? um, and, and the use of that participatory analytical planning as an analytical uh, framework to analyze what is happening. And then to understand advances in readiness, we also uh, developed a self-check, um, so a self-assessment, some questions uh, where demonstration sites can identify at the start what is their existing readiness level. And then combine it with offering a portfolio of methods and tools that will help to increase uh, the readiness. And particularly in our discussions or in our demo sites, what we were seeing is that whereas most of the resources were still going at trying to increase that re uh, technology readiness level uh, related to the knowledge and kind of the biophysical modeling and all sorts of modeling to, to show what potential impact the nature-based solution was having. The real barriers were really situated in this investment and in institutional readiness. So if you make that really obvious from the start, then of course it can also help uh, to relocate resources to that uh, and, and, and really foster the implementation. I also put a few uh, references out here uh, for further reading if you're interested. This is all very new work, which is still kind of writing it up. So uh, please also feel free to email me if you want to have uh, more information on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noor. That was very interesting. Um, looking at yeah looking at nature-based solutions and then participatory uh planning approaches for that and i think it was an exceptionally um ambitious exercise to take on that many countries cultures areas size uh and everything and i i i wanted to ask you actually with that question was so when you were performing the country context analysis for all, for all the at least the context analysis for your different areas that you were working in the different pilots um did did it make a big difference to how you went forward with your participatory planning approach um at the start no uh, let's say, I think that this kind of realization uh, of having to look at the different types of readiness was something that only grew more or less in year, at the end of year two of the project. And so um, in, in most of the demos, the focus was really still on doing all, all kinds of, yeah, flood modeling and, and landscape modeling and those kind of things. But it is true that when through the stakeholder interactions and, and all this feedback that was coming, um, what, what happened in a number of demos is that um, the concrete effect was that apart from having these purely um, interventions related to the, to the biophysical world, there were very there were a number of other interventions uh, identified that were targeting the governance that were targeting uh, the investment and mm. yeah somehow to me it was a bit strange to see that still now you know still <laughs> and i know john that we have had many conversations about that but making this a bit more obvious that it's really not only about that the technology readiness uh, level was very important even for the researchers within the project yeah or maybe particularly for the researchers within the project project and so then if we are working in this multidisciplinary team it was also good to kind of balance out uh, what had to be the the focus of each of us mm. and i think that leads well into into uh, Professor Fee's question where he says, uh, why did you not include a social readiness, um, uh, yeah, social readiness um, at, the, at the beginning of the, of, of, as you worked into those readiness levels and it probably had something to do that technology was the focus, not 
the social aspects, I guess. Yeah, so I mean, the the technology readiness level came into the project with, because this is really how the how the call is written. Yeah, so you need to bring up the technology readiness levels of your nature-based solution, and then um, we saw that the, that concept is really not sufficient. It's not about the technology readiness level, or at least not alone. Um, but yeah, social readiness and market readiness. So for us, the market readiness is part of the investment readiness. Yeah? So it's it's uh, both both the creation of the market, but also the connection of the different institutions and individuals to that market. So and the social readiness, I think there uh, there's a, there's a lot to say still. I mean, we we focused on institutional readiness, and when I was also listening to the presentations of of Malta, the, that focus on the individual actor is mm. something that we have not been looking at. And that's, yeah, um, yeah so, so this is kind of a more kind of aggregated uh, understanding of how that readiness level is built up. Yeah. And I think, and so, it's really, yeah. And no, I no, it's sorry. interesting to go more in, into that to see how you how you create it yeah yeah and before i come to your question leon i will actually go to shibley's question because it leads on from from this where he says uh do you think the societal societal adoptability of motor can reflect social readiness so if you used motor to come up with that social readiness would that um yeah do you think that would help or that would be be able to be integrated into what you were doing. Yeah, so I I I was thinking about that too, and I see that this readiness level are focusing quite a bit on the ability component, and then that that motivation component is is um, not looked at at an individual level. So I'm not sure about the adaptability, John. Um, um, and I was just the question of, of Shibli. So maybe Shibli, can you say how you see that yourself? Sorry, Nora, it just it dropped out just uh, as you were speaking that last part. So yeah, I'm not sure about the social adaptability. Um, yeah. But I wanted to hear from Shibli maybe how he sees that himself. So we have, we still have some time. So Shibli, do you actually want to ask that question uh, yourself? You should be able to unmute your your own microphone. Yeah, thank you, Nora. Yeah, it was really a nice presentation. And yes, uh, you, the radius level uh, that assistant are really interesting. And I think like, yeah, yeah we can, we can somehow integrate Mota in that case. and. The social adaptability, though it is the, this is a pers from the perspective of the local community, but maybe yeah, it's uh, maybe I'm not sure it's possible to integrate and maybe we can we can come up something with social readiness as well. But it's, yeah, but the, yeah, there is one difference is like uh, when we assess Mota, we assess from the perspective of community, but when it's the readiness, it's it's. It's, it's from the different perspective, but that would be interesting if we can able to integrate that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So in in our team, um, um, we had one of our partners doing quite some work on risk perception and social network analysis, like that, and how um, how that risk perception was evolving through exchange with the knowledge network. No? Change through discussing um, performance of nature-based solution, or having maybe also kind of um, more security on the investment or the liability uh, discussions. Um, so we have it is somehow part of the institutional and investment readiness, but we haven't really put our finger on it yet on how that then would look like. So this is indeed, I think, something interesting to explore. 
Thanks, Nora. So I think that's actually, and that's, uh, yeah, Sibley, that's something we can take forward also in as part of this group to, to look into each other's projects and to answer some of those challenges that we have. Uh, and I will, so Leon had a question about, um, could you say something about how the actors or the or actors stakeholders are part of the institutional ready, readiness assessment? Yeah, so in this, uh, um, there is kind of a, a self-checklist of questions that is asking about uh, this component of the institutional readiness. And here we did ask that uh, in, through different uh, stakeholder workshops. So it was kind of an, a discussion on uh, whether they thought that the organizations were equipped, whether the, 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 the... We had quite some conversations actually about the liabilities around the, the performance of nature-based solution. And that was one of the main things that that wasn't really understood. But also, yeah, even in the Rotterdam case, where you would think that, um, yeah, maybe the nature-based solutions are a bit more adopted already. One of these major issues really was the, um, within one organization, the municipality, the fragmentation of the responsibilities over these different uh, departments. Yeah? And so people not wanting to take the responsibility of a nature-based solution because it just wasn't sure what kind of water quality was going to come out of there. And also not having uh, the good standards established for that. So, so this assessment of the readiness was something that we did through the discussion with the stakeholders and so. Hmm. Yeah, okay. And I think that leads well also into to Professor Fee's question where he said, um, for instance, in Quan study, the green solutions, so the nature-based solutions that you've been presenting, that have been introduced into developed countries are not socially ready for Vietnam. And I, and, and I think that's a challenge within many of the Western performance-based projects that, we, that we're utilising within our own countries and then thinking that they are applicable in, in other countries, that transferability that is a, a real challenge. And without an understanding of, of the social aspects of the country that you're in, um, yeah, it can lead to huge challenges within those performance-based projects. And I think we've been doing that for the, basically since World War II, haven't we? Um, so, yeah, and then, so there was also an interesting question from Liliana from, uh, I'm guessing she's from somewhere in Latin America. And she asked the question, is there any experience of motor applications in Argentina or the rest of Latin America? And I don't know the answer to that. So Leon or, or Yap or, I guess, I don't think so. I don't think we've been to, we have that experience yet in South America. Yeah, and it's something that we were discussing earlier eh, that we would we, we would really like to get some some experience uh, there. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, it's it, high on the agenda. Open to to suggestions, especially at IG Delft, where you have and TU Delft, where you have uh, good numbers of, of American students come come through in Africa as well, as we spoke about earlier in our discussions. So um, I want to ask you one very quick question, Nora, before we wrap up and end with a couple of minutes to go about, so utilising or u using um, participatory, participatory based approaches uh, seems like a logical thing to do, but sometimes when you bring government actors together, and society actors together. And if you look at water management in Australia, for instance, this is very much the case. It leads to a massive amount of conflict. So I'm wondering, before you start the process of bringing government and society together, how do you, how do you propose that you know your situation before you enter? Like what, yeah, what, what would be a first step if you were charged with that? 
Yeah, I think uh, Leon also mentioned it before that, that the stakeholder analysis that you would have to do um, before going into engaging the stakeholders and then there's all sorts of methods and tools to also analyze the relationship between them. And one of them is focusing on the degree of conflict that exists uh, between those stakeholders. So um, in my experience, if, if this is uh, the case, when there is really um, existing conflicts or, or uh, almost exploding conflicts, then, then of course you're not necessarily going to bring these people together in the same room, um, but you might want to have start with the, in the, um, a separate engagement yeah, and then find find ways after that to, to see whether they can come together. But this is, yeah, it, it needs also, for example, we've been working quite a bit with Saki on that also, you know, you need, you need your uh, diplomacy skills to, to run such a process properly. Yeah. So, no, no, thank you. I think that's um, that's also that's something that's misunderstood within technical based projects is often uh, you could have engineers or, or natural scientists such as myself trying to run those processes without any real understanding of how to approach social situations well. Uh, and that can often lead to, to conflict increasing within your your project because you're bringing together different actors that are not ready to be brought together. So that I think it's been a huge challenge within many performance-based projects that I've worked, worked within. So we're right on um, the time, the finishing time. So thank you very much to the speakers and also thank you very much <coughs> to our participants uh, and the questions. So, as I said, there will be a third, a third, um, third seminar. Sorry, and that will be we will send out to all the registered participants. We will send out a reminder of that, and also the abstracts and and who will give those talks is is part of uh, is all together on that uh, on the website. Um, and a part of that third seminar is also very much related to where do we go from here? So there's interested parties within the participants that have been part of this. How would they see themselves being involved or what, what are some suggestions? And then um, because we really, we intend to keep this group going forward to build the application of MOTA, uh, both within our projects, but also within other projects uh, around the world. So, so thank you very much. Any questions can be posed on the website and we will do our our best to answer them and I think yeah I think those questions will probably come to you as the contact person and already looking forward to yeah to the third seminar so thank you very much and good night afternoon and possibly morning depending on where you are living so see you everyone Bye. 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 Thank you very much.